You are in implementing an enterprise design system, the Red Hat way. You guys hear me? Check the button. I did push the button. It's lit up. It's red. I'm assuming that's good. You're on air. Good to go. Cool. If you guys were looking for the free donuts, that was the other room. Sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Really love being here. Portland is such a beautifully weird city, which anywhere else it's like, hey, that's a kind of a backhanded compliment. But here people are like, yeah, we are beautifully weird in Portland. Thank you. So thank you so much again. I'm um, Derek Reese. I feel like every time I do one of these front end presentations, it's like front enders anonymous. Like, hi, I'm Derek. I'm on my 16 JavaScript framework this week. Hi, Derek. Hi, Derek. Thank you. <laughs> I'm with Red Hat. Um, we're the Linux company. I know there are others, but you know, I'm going to talk about them. <laughs> There's some sort of blurb there, but I'm a programmer. It's essentially what I do. A little back end, a little front end, a lot of in between. There are two prerequisites that were here uh, at this conference. There's also one online. It's called uh, Building Drupal Sites with Components. If you missed out on any of those presentations, uh, Chris Blooms and Clint Robinson's, they were awesome. Really sorry you missed them. You guys might be a little bit behind, but that's OK. We got time for questions. So if you feel lost, raise your hand, and we will get to you. I can't guarantee I'll answer it, but we can at least hear the question. So with those being prerequisites, they're kind of like the Star Wars of building with components. And after this, there's a really awesome session that you guys should stay tuned for. This guy up here is going to be talking. Um, that'll help cover some of the gaps in this. But we're, we're going to be trying to take a nice dive through kind of how Red Hat solved these problems. Um, so with these presentations kind of being Star Wars, if you will, you know, the, the main storyline, this is like a Star Wars story, a, a Drupal story, if you will. It's a sequel, prequel thing that kind of talks about some of the background with building and implementing design systems, and then some of the like next steps in getting it all integrated with Drupal and where you can go with it. There are three different parts to this talk. Uh, first one is digital design philosophy. So that's sort of the prequel era stuff. And that's where we talk about some of the background <laughs> and some of the uh, vocabulary that's necessary to communicate about working with design systems. And then we're going to talk about the implementation itself, which is the meat of how everything's put together and how we do stuff at Red Hat. And then finally, the cool stuff, the Drupal integration. And those are the Drupal modules that kind of help you take those next, next steps towards getting everything playing all nicely together. First part, digital design philosophy. Um, essentially, there are two different ways to talk about it, so let's get to it. First is where everything comes from. Uh, it's branding, marketing, and UX. That's your driver behind building your digital design systems. That's where everything comes from. So normally, when you're working with a client, they may already have all this work done, or maybe part of the spec that you're doing. But you don't typically approach a design system before you have any of these three things, your branding, your marketing, and your UX. You can work with it parallel, um, which is a little bit of what we do at Red Hat. Um, we have a very strong brand, and we have our own internal site, which you can kind of see a little bit of a preview here, where it's how we communicate internally. Like, this is our voice, and we're talking to people, and we need you know to be easy to understand, but authoritative, also very clear in answering questions and helpful. Uh, different things like uh, our brand colors, uh, the different designs, that we can use, like the actual visual designs that we can use on different things like slides or marketing presentations, that sort of stuff. Uh, all of the specifics about, you know, what is the spacing that we use between our logos and the different typefaces that are appropriate for different types of communications. All of that is available to us, and that's where we kind of put together our first building blocks when we're talking about our internal design system. So all of that comes together to give us what we need in order to talk about our design systems. And like I said, there's two parts to that. Design languages and design systems, OK? Design systems is something that um, was kind of addressed yesterday, but we didn't really talk about the vocabulary that's ancillary to it, that sits around it. And that's where we get design languages. So we'll go over that real quick. Design languages are visual. They're visual language. They're how we communicate. So when you are trying to 
take a concept or an idea or a story and get that communication across to a client or a customer, whoever your target audience is, this is your visual language, this is your storytelling blocks that build what your design is. It's very graphical in nature. Um, everything, instead of using words, is picture-based. So here's some examples of visual language. Um, this is all stuff that you guys might be pretty familiar with. So skeuomorphic design is uh, realism-based design. It was something that was really popularized by Apple in the 2000s. Uh, and that's the idea that if you see a design in a digital realm, you can interpret its intention and what the author wanted to communicate to you by referencing real-world objects that you would have experience with. So a calculator would look like you know, a real calculator you might see on a desk, which you already know how to interface with. Or you know, a TV with an on and off button you already have one in your living room. You understand how that's going to work for you. Or you know, the Apple's buttons, you know, each icon that's there represents something from the real world that you can relate to. And immediately it kind of helps get those ideas across. Another one is flat design. Um, and that sort of evolved as a response to skeuomorphic design. And that was the idea that skeuomorphic design is giving away too much information. It's a bit of an information overload. When you're attempting to complete a task, like in an application, there's too much going on, too much visual noise, so you want to simplify things, and make it a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to follow in a way that's logical and presentable. And you can see some examples there, including the calculator. Um, a couple of sources, but the one on the left is actually right off of Drupal.com. So we use flat design on the marketing site for Drupal. And we also have material design, as I'm sure everyone here has at least heard of, right? That's Google's big thing. And that's the idea that while flat design is cool, there's still a little bit of contextual information that we're really lacking in flat design, primarily being depth, and then secondarily being the actual texture on your designs. So all this stuff all wrapped up together, including some of the many other design systems out there, especially ones uh, popularized by companies such as Microsoft, including new fads such as vertical design or um, the Airbnb design system. All of these things are visual design languages. And I mean, you can Google any of them and see all sorts of cool, inspirational things when you're coming up with your design. Design systems, on the other hand, are organizational in nature. So if you have your visual language already built up and you understand how you're going to do communication, you still need a way to talk about it with other developers. You need a way to interface with your teammates and kind of work through solving some of those problems. Uh, it's very structural um, and it's almost code-based in a way. No matter which way you're doing your design system, whether it's on paper or you're actually you know, writing software that's going to help you build it or using one of the many available tools, there's always going to be a little bit of code, a little bit of talking to a machine, talking to people to work through the communication necessary. So here's some examples of that. Uh, monolithic design, um, that's the ide idea that the way you structure designs is page by page. You build an entire web page at a time, or even in the marketing world, you know, that's building an entire poster at a time or something like that, where you're not just going to construct your individual elements and then bring them together, but you're going to build the whole page. And, and that was something that was pretty popular in the, in the 2000s and 90s. And that got followed up by modular design. Um, and that's where we write along the same trend uh, in graphical design in our visual language where you guys saw rounded borders and tables being used on everything ever. That was a result of modular design. Our designers came in, came up with an overall system with the visual language, and then got down to building these modules. And recently, Brad Frost uh, came up with this thing called atomic design, which I'm, guys, I'm sure you guys have heard to death over this weekend and even over the past couple of months. Um, but that's the idea that you can break it down even further. You can come up with atoms, which make up molecules, which make up organisms, which are all different types of patterns that you're going to be building your application with, all design patterns. And those come together to make templates and then the actual real pages. Uh, there's a whole lot of extra info um, on the website, as well as if you guys were here yesterday or at the other presentations that go into depth on atomic design. 
Uh, we're mostly referencing from the fact that that's what we're using at Red Hat. Uh, another alternative that's pretty popular these days is style tiles. So that's just another option out there. It's not necessarily incompatible with uh, atomic design. They kind of can work together, but it is uh, another primary approach for a design system. So now that we've defined our digital design philosophy, we understand our design languages and our design systems, we need to know, all right, we have our design, you know, we have a system that we've decided to use to communicate with our developers about it. How do we get this implemented, right? If we have all of these things together, how do they actually turn up in code? Um, some of these deliverables that you will see are things like mood boards, um, PDFs, um, HTML, CSS mockups, you know, an email from a designer with like, here, this is what we're doing. All of those things work. All of those are technically implementations of design systems. We like to take things in a little more sophisticated manner because it helps clear up uh, communications issues, helps developers work together if we're all in the same development tool set. And it's also kind of cool to get this stuff implemented. So it answers, or implementation is gonna answer this specific question here, right? How do, we, how do we get our design deliverables into the system? And especially with Red Hat, we have a whole bunch of different siloed teams who are sort of building their own thing, their own applications, their own version of software that Red Hat is using to interact and communicate with our customers. So we need everybody to be on the same page because otherwise it's just a lot of rework, a lot of miscommunication, things don't line up. And we really want people to use the same design system and design system implementation. And that's kind of traditionally been a struggle, especially for large enterprise. You can get everybody on the same design system because it's designers, right? And then you bring in your front end developers and they kind of talk to each other. But once you break down past the designers and you get to your front end developers and your back end teams, because all the technology is very different, everyone wants to implement it and build it their own way. And we kind of decided, you know what, maybe we should rethink that at Red Hat. So design systems implementation. In order to think about how we're implementing our design systems, we want to break things down in kind of relatable groups of different types of implementations and figure out which one works for us. Um, these rule sets are design system docs, um, style guides. These are things that aren't necessarily an implementation of a design system, but rather a bunch of rules that will guide you into creating your design system. And then the second part of that is full implementations where you take these rule sets and kind of cascade them down all the way to building patterns in HTML and, and CSS and JavaScript or Twig or however you want to build your patterns, even React components. Um, and that's pattern libraries and frameworks kind of like Bootstrap. Those are essentially design systems implementations. So we looked at all this and said, all right, we think we got this. We think we can make an implementation that makes sense across all of our different web properties at Red Hat and maybe even other different properties, uh, things like React Native applications or some of our toolkits that run locally. So we have like maybe three or four different implementations that are all compatible, that all cover uh, different sections and almost all of our properties use a bulk of them. So we're using these same implementations across all of our different properties at, at Red Hat. The primary one is called WebRH, Web Red Hat. It's a really clever name. <laughs> um, and it is both a style rule set and an implementation. So that includes SAS um, and the generated CSS, all the build tools. Um, you know, we use uh, Grunt and Gulp internally, just like most of you guys, um, the Twig patterns. And we introduced something a little bit new, which we're really kind of excited to start contributing back to the community. And that's using JSON schemas to define how our patterns interact with editors and each other. Um, and they kind of allow people to come in and take a look at a pattern and throw all sorts of different test data at it. Or an engineer to come in and look at patterns and go, OK, I can write a system that can parse these and understand what builds up these patterns and how they relate and interact to each other. And that's all an open standard. I mean, you can go and pull down the JSON schema and use that yourself. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. Um, it does have a problem, though. It's pretty complicated. I can see so we do have a question. What's up? The, the JSON schema, that's a term I've heard. Does that refer to a concept, or does that refer to a specific um, GitHub repo somewhere? It, it refers to a spec 
that is open and freely available on the site along with, um, it's one of those types of specs that's self-referential and self-implementing. So JSON schema is implemented in JSON schema. You can download a JSON schema JSON file and that will tell you what JSON schema is. Okay. So it's, it's kind of crazy to kind of think about, but um, another example would be like a YAML file that explains how to write a YAML document. Right, YAML's readable, you can read it and kind of understand how it relates to itself. Once you've been just reading it, you can go back and go, oh, okay, a program can parse this using these same rules. That's the same idea, just with JSON. Great, thanks. Um, WebRH also powers our editors and builders. So when we have client teams come in and they're like, hey, we need to build a marketing page for this really quick and we need to get it spun up and we gotta do it in two weeks, this is what they use, they use WebRH. WebRH is the pattern library that they use for all the marketing tools and all of our editors that allow the drag and drop functionality, that's what they use. Um, it is tightly coupled together, which is also kind of adds to the complexity. So our, our rule sets and our implementations are all kind of intertwined. And that's something we're working on resolving, but it's uh, kind of our baseline here. And like I was saying, pretty much all the properties at Red Hat use this library. That is super tiny. You can also jump to. I can zoom in here. No, nope, doesn't oh, yeah. like it. All right. Uh, do this on your oh your Linux. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can't take Mac advice. Uh, there's, Sorry. There's a, there's a pinch uh, zoom. You can right click on the image, open a new tab, and then zoom in. Yeah. There. All right, so super blurry, um, but this is WebRH inside Drupal. So if you can kind of see here, each one of these is a paragraph, and this is all optional. Like you can click to kind of expand it and add things in. So each of these little red buttons here is like add a pattern from our pattern library. Um, this is very similar to a module that I'm going to be talking about in a couple minutes here called UI patterns. But the idea is we can read our JSON schemas, import those directly into Drupal as paragraphs and then fill out all that data and it goes right to the front end. We don't have to worry about mapping stuff with Twig. We don't have to worry about you know how our pattern library is communicating to the site, any of that stuff. Can you click that magnifying glass really quick on your... your uh, it's just going to be just as blurry. Anything? Okay. Yeah. It's because it downsized. Yeah. Uh, just for the audience, what's a paragraph? Um, paragraphs is a pretty popular module in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. It is a technique for building uh, recursive content. So you can define a paragraph and put it in a field in a content type, and that paragraph itself can contain references to other paragraphs, which then themselves have their own fields. So you could have like an, an image paragraph, which is an image field, like a file field in Drupal, and then under that have a description field, and then you can use that paragraph in a CTA paragraph, a call to action paragraph. So that call to action paragraph would reference the image paragraph and then have its own fields of like here's a link and here's some descriptive text and here's some configuration like do you want it to be red or do we want it to be blue and that itself can be in you know the article content type or in our case the flexible template system UI patterns content type. I know it's a lot but we have a demo that will show some of this. <laughs> So another one that we have, and this one is completely open. You guys can go grab it and download it and play with it. It's called Patternfly. It's uh, patternfly.org, I believe. Um, it's based on Bootstrap, and it's a whole bunch of application patterns for rapidly spinning up an application. So we have our marketing you know, internal stuff, which isn't really that useful for you guys unless you work for Red Hat. But Patternfly is used to pretty much power anything that's a modern application at Red Hat. So OpenShift, our container platform, that's all built using Patternfly, using freely available open source patterns. And you can grab, we have a SAS implementation, a LESS implementation, really whatever flavor you're looking for, you can grab and kind of play around with. Patternfly is an open source project, right? Yep, 100% open source, no licensing, anything. Just go and grab it. I think it's just like MIT, and that's it. Is that a Red Hat project? Or? It is a Red Hat project, yes, 100%. Um, and it, like I said, it's based on Bootstrap. So if you know Bootstrap, then you already know a lot of what's behind Patternfly. So that's the SAS CSS. 
um, separate documentation. So it's a mix between a rule set and like a very light guideline implementation. There's guidelines for how you want to build your specific patterns, like your HTML and your Twig, but it's not necessarily required that you use them. So it rather kind of ships with all these default classes and tool sets that you can use, just like Bootstrap does, uh, to build your applications very, very rapidly. Uh, as an example, we spin, uh, or rather we spun up a, an applications dashboard that monitored all of the automatic container parsing and evaluation at Red Hat in about a day and a half, and it went straight into production. So it's fast, really easy to use quotes around the easy. If you know Bootstrap, you know this. Um, and it is skinnable, so we do have our own style sheet that can ship with it internally to Red Hat called RCUE. And it's the same sort of process you would use if you were gonna skin pattern fly yourselves. Just set a couple of colors, set a couple of uh, styles that you're gonna use globally across the application, and it'll pick it all up, ingest it, and use it. So you can automatically get an application that looks pretty good, that fits within your brand guidelines, that fits within your design system, pretty much out of the box. Yeah, doesn't like to load the screenshots. Um, so this is a screenshot of Patternfly. Uh, essentially, this is what you'll also get online. So it, they use Patternfly to build Patternfly. We got kind of a theme here. A lot of the technology that we use, kind of we dog food it. It's recursive implementation. If we build something, we use it to build the next version of it or to showcase it. So Patternfly itself, all of its uh, library implementations is built in Patternfly. And then all the rule sets are on there, all the demos and everything is the exact code that you would use when you're implementing Patternfly. And so again, that's used across most of our uh, online web applications. My team, uh, which is called the Connect team, Connect for uh, Technology Partners. Um, this is all sorts of like, uh, get certified for Red Hat software. So if you have a container and you wanna be able to deploy it easily on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and you want all of our customers to be aware of it and have the support and infrastructure there, you go through my team. Um, and we're using WebRH, we're using Patternfly, and we're also using our own UI patterns library that's accessible within Red Hat that everyone else can pull from and use. And these application patterns are compatible with both WebRH and Patternfly. Um, and that mostly has to do with the way that these are opinionated rule sets, but they're not required usage. So with Patternfly, you can build your markup in a way that's compatible with multiple systems. Uh, this one's very dev-centric, so it's not something that you're really gonna get something useful for, but the idea is that you can take multiple pattern libraries, including the open source pattern fly, use them in your site along with your other existing pattern libraries altogether. So you gotta see where I'm going with this, with the idea that once there are more open source pattern libraries, you could take a website and grab four or five of them throw them into your theme folder or however you set up your patterns, build each of them and then mix and match in Drupal to get the site that you need without having to build any of it yourself. It's kind of building on the shoulders of giants is the, the goal here. Give you a screenshot of that. So um, we render our library in both Pattern Lab and we have a public facing one for uh, our designers for reference, it's done in just KSS node because it spins up really quick. Uh, and there's not too much that they can mess around with it. But some of these patterns here, like um, the Drupal messages pattern, use components from Patternfly. So we didn't actually have to build much of anything. We just added one or two styles on it and it just worked. So there is a part two to this though. You can't just like implement it and call it a day and everything's you know good. Sure, you built something, but just because you built it doesn't mean that they will come. So that's kind of the part two of implementation, it's the responsibility part, and that's adoption, education, and tooling. Adoption is selling it to both the business itself, um, because it's not necessarily free to kind of build these types of systems. It might be a little costly. It helps that things are open source, like Pattern Lab, right, but you don't want to really build Pattern Lab yourself. It's expensive to do something like that. Um, so the, tool to, the two tools that we use to do that is case studies. So we'll come in and say, um, all right, we built a marketing site uh, three months ago for this segment of the business. It's relatively the same size and scale as this other segment of the business that needed a marketing site. 
and the new one was built using our flexible template system with these existing pattern libraries. And the old one was built the traditional way where we built all the back end in Drupal and then we had themers come in and theme it. And we saved X amount of dollars and X amount of hours. Now, yeah, it's not gonna be an exact comparison, but that's invaluable for someone who's in the business who's kind of understands what you're doing and is behind it but needs something that they can talk about you know, to higher ups or whoever's in charge of making the finance decisions of, hey, this isn't a direct comparison, but this is close enough to go, we're getting gains from this. And this is something that's appreciated and used by both our developers as well as our internal uh, marketing teams. Second is selling it to developers. And this is usually more difficult, especially as your company is growing or expanding into different teams and adopting this process. This is a tough one, and we've kind of solved it with two things. The first being a scrum of scrums. So even though you might have your daily stand-ups and kind of meet with the other people on your team, you're not doing a lot of communication with the other teams necessarily. So once a month, we have a web patterns working group. Everybody's invited, and we come in, and whoever has updates to give does their scrum update, and we all communicate that with each other. So it doesn't necessarily mean people are adopting the design systems or working with the decisions that we've made, but it does mean they're hearing them. And if they hear them, they're parsing them and remembering it. So when they come to a crossroads where they need to make a decision about a design system, they're already aware of all the work that's gone into these things, and they now know it's an option for them to pursue. And nine times out of 10, they do. You know, we'll, we'll get an email or something like, hey, let's set up a meeting. I remember talking about all this stuff with you guys in our Scrum of Scrums. Let's get on it. You know, let's start using these design systems and pattern libraries and implementations. Um, and the second is, and a, more like an approach than a thing to do. And that approach is to always come in with a mindset of learning. So when we were building our pattern system and trying to advocate to other teams that, hey, this is what you want to get onto, this is what you want to use, we'd always come in and say, hey, we want to learn how you guys are building stuff. We want to hear from you. What's your experiences and what are the troubles that you've had trying to work with your systems? And then we can kind of relate that to this system that we've built and say, okay, maybe this is a good solution for that particular problem you run into. And that's a much better adoption rate than just kind of coming into a call and be like, all right, we built this cool new thing, you guys need to use it. Everyone's gonna be like, really? I don't know, man. Seems like a lot of work. Documentation is the next part. Um, this one's kind of a little bit on the easier side because most tool sets, especially like Pattern Lab or KSS, come with the ability to document the patterns that you're building. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of show some of that in a little bit. But it does kind of also uh, smell like a trap because you get all these lovely fields or places to put your documentation and you're like, eh, I'll get to it later. It's not that important. We know how our patterns work. Front end developers all know how it works. The back end developers are cool with it. You know, what do we need the documentation for? Getting other teams to adopt it, getting the business to understand why you need to adopt it. And that's where that documentation becomes really important. Because if another team member is on your scrum of scrums, they go back to you know, their team or their group that they're working on this stuff with, and they're like, oh, okay, I remember that thing that we talked about, and I want to go back and look it up and talk to my team about it. All of a sudden, if that documentation isn't there and well-written and self-explanatory, they now have to hit you up and your team up and waste their time, or at least consume a good amount of time, redoing all that knowledge transfer. This saves a lot of time and really speeds up adoption rate. Um, and you want to make sure it's in a place that's accessible. You shouldn't have to download a pattern library to read the documentation on it. If it's hosted on GitHub, um, or like Patternfly has its own Patternfly built documentation site, you can go visit it. It's online. You can send somebody the link, and that's it. They don't have to go and you know build it on their system to be able to read and understand how it works. Um, and then, of course, knowledge shares, presentations, this sort of stuff. I don't just come here and do these presentations, I do them internally. So even if it's not as formal, I'm still prepping a slideshow or a demo and walking teams through this stuff. Even if it's not something they're ready to use right then and there, it's good because it's in the back of their mind and it's something they're going to remember when they encounter the same problems. So our current status versus kind of what this presentation is and where we want to be. It's kind of a mess, there's a lot of text there. <laughs> to break it out for you, um, each one of these pattern libraries kind of has the same methodology. They're twig files, they have JSON schema files, uh, and SAS or CSS, and maybe a little bit of JavaScript. But the tooling itself is kind of a little bit all over the place. We have our own internal version of Pattern Lab 
that we are working on contributing back out to the community uh, called Pattern Kit REST Server. Um, and that has Composer and Grunt and Bower in it. And then the Drupal module, which is essentially the Drupal 8 UI Patterns module or a version of that. Um, this Pattern Builder Importer module, and we're kind of deprecating that in favor of the modules that the open source community is working with, so UI patterns. And then in Drupal 7, something that I'm going to be talking about here in a minute called Pattern Kit. So our goal here is to take all of that junk and build it all in the same dev tooling system. And everything's already kind of in the right direction because we've invested in Twig. We've invested in the JSON schema. Um, so really all we need is kind of to get our dev tooling on the same page and then our Drupal modules on the same page. So that's unifying our dev tools and then training and maintaining these open source projects that are so integral to our system. So here's the real meat of the, of the presentation, the Drupal integrations. These are the two modules that will take you from writing presenter twig like this, which in Drupal 8, um, if you guys were not there for the prerequisite <coughs> presentations, essentially this is a regular Drupal twig template file that takes the data from Drupal and then grabs one of your pattern files and pulls that in. So we're referencing the namespace pattern library. This would be like pattern fly, for example, or WebRH. Um, and then in a subdirectory that has the pattern itself, the twig file, pulling that into Drupal and saying, hey, this is the Drupalism. We're going to send you the image and the source and the alt text, the attributes and the sources. And this image pattern is going to build that up in a way that fits our design system. But that's a lot of work. And even though that's kind of a good way to solve that problem, we figured we could do it a little better. So this is a, a module that's built in the community. Um, and I think uh, the past couple of Drupal cons, we've had awesome presentations from some of the people who worked on it, kind of go over it. Uh, UI patterns is essentially what we're using internally in Drupal 7, um, the flexible template system. They're kind of the same pieces of technology. So this is where we're headed, um, contributing that code back and getting it all working together and standardizing on the open source solution. UI patterns module is awesome. Um, but it's also very specific in its use cases in that it takes your patterns and, like I mentioned previously, imports them directly into Drupal, and usually using paragraphs um, as the method of choice for building the patterns inside Drupal. There are multiple integrations, so it does work with like uh, paragraphs or views or display suite. Um, but it's again, it's all one-to-one -one mapping. So if you have a single field in Drupal, it needs to be a field that is supported by the pattern on the front end for it to show up. Uh, but it does work with Pattern Lab, um, and it, it does work with KSS and a couple of other uh, design implementation toolkits. Um, and you can kind of see like on the right hand side here a little bit of how it's structured. It's a little bit harder to read, I guess, on this projector. But you have Pattern Lab, or you know Fractal, or KSS, or whatever you're using for your pattern library. And then the UI patterns module ingests all of that data into Drupal, and then it can create you know paragraphs and put those in your content types, or work with the display suite to let you select your fields and choose where they're going, or use the layout system, which is just out of the box in Drupal now, to present that all the way over to the Drupal theme layer. And this is kind of what it looks like in Drupal. Um, I'll, I'll go a little more in depth on the demo. But essentially over here to our left, we have a content type. We've selected the pattern that the UI patterns module has been able to pick up. Uh, it uses YAML for that. Uh, our internal one uses JSON schema. Um, and we're looking at contributing that back. But you select your pattern here, and then on the front end, it's able to kind of pull in that full list of patterns with the sample data and build out what your library can look like. Pattern Kit is our Drupal 7 answer to all of this, because um, a lot of our sites are still on Drupal 7, which is cool. We want to move to Drupal 8, but the first step towards moving everything to Drupal 8 is making sure that our front end matches what we want our Drupal 8 front end to be. And that means we're using all of our Twig pattern libraries that work in Drupal 7 and 8, um, and that we're using the same sorts of technologies. So our panels in Drupal 7 today are the blocks and the same functionality as Drupal 8 and tomorrow. 
the pattern kit is kind of that in-between step from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 while keeping the same front end design, same design system, same design system implementation, which is Twig, JSON schema, and that's all built within Pattern Lab. Um, there is kind of a catch though with this. It's a brand new module, uh, so it's something we're using internally, but it's not quite ready for the community, so we're kind of launching that soft launch this week. Um, but it does allow you to do full data mapping. So you can take anything that Drupal recognizes as a token, uh, if it's an image or multiple text fields or links, put those tokens together and send them over to Pattern Kit and it'll understand that and then put those in the patterns wherever you need them to. So you don't need your back-end data to match your front-end patterns. You can have a pre-existing site and map that over to any front-end pattern that you could want. So if you want you know, an article sections to go over to a CTA pattern and have that as a preview, you don't have to build everything specifically for it. You just map it and it works, kind of like your Twig presenter layer, except you don't have to type it. It just drag and drop or select and hit save on panels. Um, and it does require Twig 3D7 beta 3 right now, although we are removing that dependency. We have a, a pull request on GitHub right now that removes that dependency entirely. So you could use a site built in Drupal 7 PHP template and pull in Twig patterns, like from Patternfly, just by dropping that in your theme layer and using this module. So that's, yeah, really exciting stuff. Uh, so hopefully we'll get that reviewed this weekend or this week and get that up on Drupal.org. And this is a little bit what it looks like. So you go into panels, um, you go into the pattern kit section, and you have your list of all your patterns that are provided in your pattern lab install. So that's Patternfly or WeberH in our case. This is specifically WeberH. Um, and I pulled in a standard text component, which has configurable background and colors uh, and themes. And you can see some of these fields here that are automatically pulled in through the JSON schema editor. So if you have an existing pattern library and you want that pattern library to work in a Drupal 7 site, you build the JSON schema file, which informs the site itself of all the different fields that are involved in configuring that pattern, and then pull it into the pattern kit module, and it'll render it out on the front end in Twig, just as you see it in Pattern Lab. So this is the demo section. Uh, fingers crossed everything goes according to plan. <laughs> so this is a Drupal 8 install. I was originally intending on kind of walking you guys through the commands to get here, but it turns out on the internet here that takes forever and we're not gonna sit around for 20 minutes while I do that. So I do have reference commands at the end of this presentation. So you guys can kind of copy paste and try that on your own. It uh, uses Docker for Drupal and a UMN generator and then Composer. So it's literally two commands you run and you get a working Drupal 8 site and then you can install UI patterns on it and pull in something like a Zerb foundation theme with the foundation patterns and it works. So that's what this one's specifically using. But without building anything yourself, without having to come up with your own patterns, you can use the pre-existing pattern library and have it work in your Drupal site. So this is the, the preview that it has available Real here. Quick, that Zerb Foundations, what is that? It's a pattern library module for Drupal 8? It is a pattern library theme for Drupal 8. It's called Zerb. Yes, Zerb Foundation is the base theme, right. um, and then Zerb Foundation Patterns is the pattern library itself. So you pull those in. Um, and they use the UI patterns module. And there's a config module that will also pre-build all of these paragraphs for you, so you can kind of just get things working out of the box. And that's all kind of documented on that site as well, so there's a link at the end of the presentation you can grab that from. But these are all the different out-of-the-box working patterns that ship with it. And these are all working twig patterns that you could also you know, have show up in Pattern Lab or that sort of thing. It's at the end of the presentation, okay. so it'll, it'll be up there, I promise. And the slides will be uploaded right after this. So here's our content types. We built a, a little example content type that has a field on it. And this is where paragraphs comes in. So 
these loaded up. Okay, so here's our display for that content type. And this is uh, the paragraphs type itself. So all of this stuff kind of gets generated uh, from the pattern library itself. And each one of these fields maps over one to one between Drupal and the pattern library. And then you can kind of see this is what the unthemed, unstyled output is. It has enough styles to like get the little Seymour link and the icon and you know the basic theming and stuff. But you can put your own styles on top of this to kind of build your way to a full site already with all these patterns kind of building the basics of it. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So this, this module is going to, purely based on the JSON schema, it's going to... This is UI Patterns, Drupal 8. So in this case, it wants YAML, and we're going to be contributing support for JSON schema to it. Okay. Let's but it's that, essentially the same thing. Happen. Right. And then I write a JSON schema that is reflecting the, the dynamic variables of my Twig templates, mm -hmm. and then press a button, and now my Drupal instance has... Well, clear the caches. Clear the caches. <laughs> right, right. Uh, now my Drupal instance has the bundles built with the fields attached to them, just mm -hmm. like that? Yes. Now, of course, you can kind of see there's there's a bit of a catch with that, right? You now have maybe a library full of 500 patterns, and you're using them all on your site, and now you have 500 paragraphs, even though maybe half of them are pretty much the same CTA thing, right? Yeah. So that's that's a little bit of the catch there, and that's where we're talking about the Drupal 7 Pattern Kit module and its ability to do data mapping. So instead of importing stuff directly, you now use your pre-existing structure, your articles and your... Uh, marketing templates and everything and map that over to the front end so you don't run into that issue. Uh, Redhat.com in specific uses a combination of these two strategies. So we use our internal version of the UI patterns module and import stuff for like really basic you know one-off marketing pages that we just got to build right then and there. But for long-term stuff that we're going to be maintaining and we're going to keep that content type around, we're going to be building the back end and then map that data over to the front end. That's kind of where all this is headed together. Quick question: How are you? How is UI? Uh, how is this handling the namespaces thing when one pattern references another? It says, "Hey, this molecule wants to pull in this at atoms." It requires the components module component for Drupal eight. Yes. And in as long as those namespaces are registered mm -hmm. in, in Drupal's YAML theme system, theme yes, system, it's cool. It just knows. Yep, it just works. Uh, same way that Pattern Lab can handle namespaces, Drupal can understand it and work with them. Structure here. Okay, cool. And this is just something I built for the demo here. But you can see, so we got the regular body field, and then this is the callout itself. So this is a paragraph reference to the paragraph that UI patterns imported from the pattern module. So from that pattern library, I mean, it's, that, that's all it is. It's just we want it to work with this particular pattern. So we check it, save the settings, and you get out of the box all these fields that are exactly one to one with what your patterns are in their library. So we can change our callout copy here to. Good enough for us. And there it shows. Showing up in Drupal, rendered on the pattern. Obviously without really fancy styles, but good enough for us today. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, spin up the Red Hat version of this with the pattern module real quick.
Sorry, I'm, I'm running a bash script. Go figure. That's what we do at Red Hat. Run bash scripts on Linux. Cool. So what I have running here is uh, Tmux with Tmuxinator pre-configured. It's a terminal multiplexer. It works on anything iTerm, uh, Termford, uh, Fedora, and essentially gives you multiple different sessions that can all be running simultaneously. So one's going to start up our local Docker instance of our site. Another one's going to go into Git. Another one's going to go build the theme for me. Get all of that running. And let me go ahead and set this over to you. Plus one for Tmux, by the way. I've been using it for like four years now. It's would never get it up. And Tmuxinator. Okay. Let's get the actual site up. So local site should be up and running. Okay, so I got the local site up, and that's all running in Docker uh, on RHEL. Okay. I really wish I could have gotten screen mirroring working, so I don't have to keep turning around, but apologize. We will keep moving ahead, keep trucking. I apologize, this is a, a Drupal 7 site running on PHP 5, so it's a little bit on the slow side, but Docker helps speed this stuff up a lot. It's a very, very complicated site. see that a little better. So what we're using here to switch um, between our different systems is theme key. Go ahead and enable pattern kit.
Yes, I do. I do want to continue. Thank you, Drupal. How are we on time? Eh, we can probably get to this in five minutes. So maybe while we're waiting, just how does this help you handle, or does this help you handle if your brand team decides that they don't like the color red being used on your properties and they want to change the color red, or you know, just to use that as a, kind of like a made-up example because your red hat is red. That's an excellent question. Very theoretical, right? Because red hat's never going to change from red. I don't think we'll become blue hat anytime soon. No, but I, mean, like but I, I do get it. Um, they decide their page looks to 2015, and the red needs to change from one hex value to another. Right. So the page itself, right, would be built up of these different patterns, right? And one of those patterns would be um, the header area with the red background, right? right. So that pattern is a twig template. Uh, CSS styles and maybe like some JavaScript to support the different menu options. So our front-end developers would go in, update that pattern, commit it to the repo, and then any time that we update our sites or like we have a Jenkins job that does this for, auto for us automatically, it'll grab the WebRH pattern library and pull it in every like 30 minutes or something like that. So we get the latest stuff on our site immediately. Um, okay. But and somebody's still tweaking the CSS files. Right, right. Okay. Um, now, there are certain patterns in WebRH where you can configure the backgrounds. It's a variable that's in the pattern that's exposed through the JSON schema. So in that case, if you know somebody on the marketing team is like, hey, uh, just for this one particular page or this subset of pages, depending on how they're built and how they're related to each other, let's change that header color from a red to a dark gray. They can go in there, go into the pattern, go to that drop down that's provided via the JSON schema, and go from red to dark gray, save it on production, and there you go. When you deploy the content, uh, if you're using like you know uh, any of the content scheduling modules in Drupal that's available, it's updates, and there you go. You're just waiting on uh, you know your edge cache to pick it up. Cool. We're in edge cache is a CDN term. Content. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if everybody knows that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, it's hard to figure out where people are. Some people are very technical and, and know that stuff, and other people are like, I pay a guy for that. Come on. I have a question about the pattern integration with the code on the website. Mm -hmm. So if the front end developer happens to change one of the names in the field that's getting integrated through the UI patterns module or whatever thing, and then it gets it goes through whatever review process you have and gets deployed, how do you know that your site's broken? That's an excellent question. Um, that's something that we handle personally with uh, policy. So we don't do we only do non breaking changes for our patterns. So it does mean we get some legacy, you know, fields in there that are like no longer supported or mapped differently in order to keep the legacy site, you know, running and working with it. But they do get marked deprecated, and we do have tools that will run in Gulp that'll parse all that and spit out a list like, "Hey, you're using all this stuff that's still deprecated. You know, you should probably get rid of it in the next year or so." I don't know. Um, the UI patterns module in Drupal 8 that's available as contrib right now will just import and add the new field. So I don't think they have a mechanism right now for notifying you, but I'm pretty sure that there's an issue in the contrib queue on drupal.org for that sort of stuff, tracking it, understanding it, knowing how to handle it, versioning, that sort of stuff. Chris over here, um, do you guys know of any like 
eight hour walkthrough that somebody's recorded, like a live coding kind of thing, like start to finish, um, like actual, an actual like example site. Yeah, being able to go from design all the way to Drupal implementation. Yeah, but design like design system in between. But not like a foo bar kind of site, like let's build a pet sitting website or something, you know, something like that. Um, that would need to be a series for yeah. sure, right? A couple per per thing. Um, I know that the presentation I did yesterday is the first that's going to be a kickoff of like a six to seven part blog series for the PT blog, website. Yeah. So what we're going to end up having, and actually is Ryan Conklin in the room? See, okay, so he's got the first blog series up about the particle stuff, and there's going to be recordings of us doing some of pieces. Yeah. Okay. And that'll be up on uh, just the phase two blog website. So I'm a little bit short on time here, and I got a couple more slides to get through real quick. But essentially, this is kind of the example of a pattern kit working on a live site. So we went into our content, added from the pattern kit section, um, the standard text pattern, and saved and added it to our C Tools panels page here. And that's essentially just going to end up displaying on the front end as this little piece of standard text. So if we have time for questions afterwards, we can kind of get into that. But just to wrap up. So a couple things to note real quick. Um, we're using Twig for D7 to render this stuff instead of the uh, built-in pattern kit Twig renderer. You need some patches um, in beta 3. So there's a couple things in the issue queue to kind of take a look at. Uh, Zerb Foundation itself, which is one of the things that I used to do the demo today, uh, has some node stash issues. So that stuff does need to be updated. And I do have notes on that that'll be posted on the page for this presentation. Um, and Drupal theme builds are still kind of really complicated. There's still a lot of steps to them. So we haven't quite gotten to the point where it's like NPM run build for everything, even though that is the goal and that's where we want to head with all of this. Or, you know, the typical Linux configure make process. As far as where we're taking this in the future, um, one of the other big considerations that we're really keeping in mind is right now, if you do Twig, right, it's all server side rendered. It's all being handled by PHP. There always has to be a request or query made back to the server to get these patterns. And what we're experimenting with right now and keeping in mind as we work on this tooling so we're not blocking ourselves off from it is using web components with the Twig template, with JSX, with our CSS and stylings and putting that in a space where it can be client side rendered as well as server side. So your first request to get the page built is done in Drupal. It's handled with your pattern library all on the server side, but then the additional data for the app is streamed in, and we use web components to go ahead and rebuild them live on the client side using those exact same patterns without having to alter them at all. So that's kind of where we're headed with this sort of stuff. And pattern kits kind of that, the modules are dividing line of where we're starting to move towards that direction. So this means you get to keep all your old patterns, you get to keep all your old design systems implementations, they're just going to work as web components in the kind of JavaScript front end future. So here's your action checklist. Um, this is essentially everything that we just went over today in one tiny little checklist. The first one is make sure you start with the visual language of your design and decide on a design systems implementation that works for you. Atomic Design is what we use at Red Hat. Um, choose your option that works best with your style guide and library and frameworks. We use our own internal version of Pattern Lab that we're going to be contributing stuff back out to. Uh, and then Drupal integration, invest in a pattern-based system. So in our case, right, that's Pattern Kit and then Drupal 8 UI patterns. Um, but there are a couple of other things that are coming up on the horizon that use the same sort of stack. And Twig plus a schema implementation like YAML or JSON uh, it seems to be kind of a really solid investment and way to go. We're, at a, we're pretty much out of time here. So there's some links here for getting involved, uh, some resources. These will all be online. You can kind of look them up and click through the links and stuff. A reference for the commands I use to do the demo. And special thanks and thank you guys. <laughs> we have any questions real quick as we wrap this up? He can meet you outside for questions. Awesome. <laughs>